and we are back reading from the hidden life of trees by peter woleben we are at chapter 22 and the title is hibernation something i actually haven't heard for a while <laughs> anyway okay it's late summer and the forest is in a strange mood the trees have exchanged the lush green in their crowns for a washed out version of verging on yellow it seems as though they are getting increasingly tired. Exhaustion is setting in, and the trees are waiting for the stressful season to end. Woo! Amen! They feel just like we do after a busy day at work, ready for a well-earned rest. Grizzly bears hibernate, and so do dormice. But trees? Do they experience anything that could, com could be compared to our nightly timeouts? The grizzly bear is a good candidate for comparison because it follows a similar strategy to trees. In summer and early fall, it eats to lay down a thick layer of fat it can live off all winter. And this is exactly what our trees do as well. Of course, they don't feed on blueberries or salmon, but they fuel themselves with energy from the sun, <laughs> which they use to make sugar and other compounds they can hold in reserve. And they store these under the skin just like a bear. Because they can't get any fatter, only their bones, that is to say their wood, can grow. The best they can do is fill their tissues with food. And whereas... Bears can go on eating everything they can find. At some point, the tree gets full. You can see this very well, especially if you look at wild cherries, bird cherries, and wild service trees any time after August. Even though there are many beautiful sunny days they could make use of before October, they begin to turn red. And what that means is that they are shutting up shop for the year. The storage spaces underneath under their bark and in their roots are full. If they made more sugar, there would be nowhere to stash it. While the bears happily go on eating, for these trees, the sandman is already knocking on the door. Most of the tree species seem to have la larger storage areas and they continue to photosynthesize hungrily and without taking a break, break right until the first hard frosts. That sounds more, more like the current human experience. Uh, then they too must stop and shut down all activity. One reason for this is water. It, it must be liquid for the tree to work. It must be liquid for the tree to work with it. Okay, if the tree's blood freezes, not only does nothing work, but things can go badly wrong. If wood is too wet when it freezes, it can burst like a frozen water pipe. This is the reason most species begin to gradually reduce the moisture content in their wood. And this means cutting back on activity as early as July. But trees can't switch to winter mode yet. For two main reasons. First, unless they are members of the cherry family, they use the last warm days of late summer to store energy. And second, most species still need to fetch energy reserves from the leaves and get them back into their trunk and roots. Above all, they need to break down their green coloring, chlorophyll, into its component parts so that the following spring day they can send large quantities of it back out into new leaves. As this pigment is pumped out of the leaves, the yellow and brown colors that were there all along predominate. These colors are made out of carotene and probably serve as alarm signals. Around this time, aphids and other insects are seeking shelter in cracks in the bark where they will be protected from low temperatures. Healthy trees advertise their readiness to defend themselves in the coming spring by displaying brightly colored fall leaves. Aphids and co. recognize these trees as unfavorable places for their offspring because they will probably 
be particularly vigorous about producing toxins. Therefore, they search out weaker, less colorful trees. But why bother with all this extravagance? Many conifers demonstrate that things can be done differently. They simply keep all their green finery on their branches and thumb their noses at the idea of an annual makeover. To protect its needles from freezing, the conifer fills them with antifreeze. To ensure it doesn't lose water to transpir transpiration over the winter, it covers the exterior of its needles with a thick layer of wax. As an extra precaution, the skin on its needles is tough and hard, and the small breathing holes on the underside are buried extra deep. All these precautions combine to prevent the tree from losing any significant amount of water. Such a loss would be tragic, because the tree wouldn't be able to replenish supplies from the frozen ground. It would dry out and could die of thirst. In contrast to needles, leaves are soft and delicate. In other words, they are almost defenseless. It's little wonder beeches and oaks drop them as quickly as they can at the first hint of frost. But why didn't these trees simply develop thicker skins and antifreeze over the course of their evolution? Does it really make sense to grow millions of new leaves per tree every year, use them for a few months and then go to the trouble of discarding them again? Apparently, evolution says it does, because when it developed deciduous trees about 100 million years ago, conifers had already been around on this planet for 170 million years. This means that deciduous trees are relatively are a re relatively modern invention. Okay, when you take a closer look, their behavior and fall actually makes a lot of sense. By discarding their leaves, they avoid a critical force, winter storms. When storms blow through forests in Central Europe from October on, it's a matter of life and death for many trees. Winds blowing at more than 60 miles an hour can uproot large trees, and for some, and some years, 60 miles an hour is a weekly occurrence. Fall rains often... Soften the forest floor so it's difficult for tree roots to find purchase in the muddy soil. The storms pummel mature trunks with forces equivalent to a weight of approximately 220 tons. Any tree unprepared for the onslaught can't withstand the pressure and falls over. But deciduous trees are well prepared. To be more aerodynamic, they cast off all their solar panels. And so a huge surface area of 1,200 square yards disappears and sinks to the forest floor. This is the equivalent of a sailboat with a 130 foot tall mast dropping a 100 by 130 foot mainsail. And that's not all. The trunk and branches are shaped so that their combined wind resistance is somewhat less than that of a modern car. Moreover, the whole construction is so flexible that the forces of a strong gust of wind are absorbed and distributed throughout the tree. Man, trees are cool. <laughs> uh, these measures all work together to ensure that hardly anything happens to deciduous trees over the winter. If there's an unusually strong hurricane force wind, the kind that happens only every five to ten years in Europe, the tree community stands together to help each individual tree. Every trunk is different. Each has its own pattern of woody fibers, a testament to its unique history. This means that after the first gust, which bends all the tree in the same direction, at the same time, each tree springs back at a different speed. And usually it is the subsequent gusts that do a tree in because they catch the tree while it's still severely bowed and bend and bend it over again even farther this time but in an intact forest every tree gets help as the crowns swing back up they hit each other because each of them is straightening up at its own pace 
While some are still moving backwards, others are already swinging forward again. The result is a gentle impact which slows both trees down. By the time the next gust of wind comes along, the trees have almost stopped moving altogether and the struggle begins all over again. I never tire watching, of watching tree crowns move back and forth. What? I can see both the movement of the whole community and the movements of individual trees. Ooh. Bear in mind, however, that it's never a good idea to go into the forest during a storm. Let's get back to the subject of dropping leaves. With every winter they survive, the trees prove that this makes sense and that producing new leaves every year is worth the energy it takes. But it brings up completely different dangers. Once One of these is snowfall. Snow makes it imperative that deciduous trees drop their leaves in a timely manner. Once the aforementioned 1,200 square yards of leaf surface has disappeared, the white blanket has no place to land but on the branches, and this means that most of it falls through onto the ground. Ice can generate even heavier loads of snow. A few years ago, I experienced weather conditions that combined temperatures slightly below freezing with a seemingly harmless drizzle. This unusual weather lasted for three days, and as each hour passed, I became more and more worried about the forest. The light rain landing on freezing branches turned to ice in seconds, quickly weighing the branches down. It looked incredibly beautiful. All the trees were encased in crystal, Whole stands of young birches were bent down under the weight of the ice, and with a heavy heart, I was already giving them up for lost. In the case of mature trees, it was above all the conifers, mostly Douglas firs and pines, that lost up to two-thirds of the green branches in their crowns, which broke off with a loud, cracking sound. That weakened the trees considerably, and it will take decades for them to completely rebuild their crowns. But the bent over young birches surprised me. When the ice melted several days later, 95% of the trunks stood tall again. Today, a few years later, there's no sign that anything happened to the trees. Of course, there were a few that didn't manage to spring back. They died at some point, uh, their rotten little trunks broke, and they are now slowly turning themselves into hummus. So, dropping leaves is an effective protective strategy that it seems to made to measure for the climate in Central European latitudes. It is also an opportunity for trees to finally excrete waste. Just as we take a trip to a quiet little room before we go to bed, Trees also rid themselves of substances they do not need and would like to part with. These drift, d uh, mm, these drift down to the ground in their discarded leaves. Shedding leaves is an active process, so the tree cannot go to sleep yet. After the reserve supplies have been reabsorbed from the leaves back into the trunk, the tree grows a layer of cells that closes off the connection between the leaves and the branches. You can, you, you can literally observe this. We get a small, you know, like the small beginnings of a future tree that you, you know, you can sort of raise in, in, its, in, a, in a little pot. Um, or like a small branchy plant. Uh, you can you can observe this. It's actually it's quite interesting. It's amazing how fast it how fast it happens. Yeah. You know. Um. Anyway. Uh. Okay. Where is it? Mm -hmm. Alright. Now all it takes is a light breeze and the leaves drift down to the ground. Only when that process is complete can trees retire to rest. And this they must do to recuperate from the exertions of the previous season. Yeah, let's all take that in. Mm -hmm. mm. Yo. 
Sleep deprivation affects trees and people in much the same way. It is life-threatening. That's why oaks and beaches can't survive if we try to grow them in containers in our living rooms. We don't allow them to get any rest there, and so most of them die within the first year. Young trees standing in their parents' shadow exhibit a few clear deviations from the standard strategy for shedding leaves. When the mother trees lose their leaves, sunlight suddenly floods the ground. The eager young pups are waiting for just this moment and they take advantage of the bright light to fill up with lots of energy and they are usually surprised by the first frost while they are at it. If temperatures are well below freezing, with nights lower than 23 degrees Fahrenheit, the trees have no option but to start yawning and begin hibernation. Now it's too late to grow a separating layer of cells and jettison, jettisoning leaves is no longer an option. However, this is no big deal for the tiny trees because they are so small the wind is no threat and even snow is rarely a problem. In the spring, the young trees exploit a similar opportunity. They leaf out two weeks before the large trees, ensuring themselves a long leisurely breakfast in the sun. But how do the youngsters know when they need to get started? After all, they don't know the date when the mother trees might leaf out. It's warm temperatures close to the ground that give the game away. Spring really is rung in here approximately two weeks earlier than it is 100 feet high up in the canopy. Up high, harsh winds and freezing cold nights delay the warm season for a little while longer. It's a protective canopy created by the branches of the old trees that keeps heavy late frost from reaching the ground. At the same time, the layer of leaves covering the soil acts like a warming compost pile, allowing the, th 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 the thermometer to climb a couple of degrees. Counting the days they benefited from the fall, the, younger, the youngsters can enjoy one month of free growth time. And that's almost 20% of the growing days available to them. Not bad. Among deciduous trees, there are different approaches to frugal living. Most trees draw energy re reserves back into their branches before they shed their leaves. But a few don't seem to care. Alders, for example, happily drop bright green leaves onto the ground as though they, they were no tomorrow. Alders, however, usually grow in swampy, nutrient-rich soil and can apparently afford the luxury of producing new chlorophyll every year. Fungi and bacteria at the base of the trees recycle the discarded leaves to produce the raw materials the alders need to build chlorophyll. And all the trees need to do this, to do is take these building blocks up through their roots. They don't even have to worry about recycling nitrogen, thanks to the symbiotic relationship they have with bacteria and nodules on their roots, which constantly provide them with all the nitrogen they need. Per year and square mile of elder forest, these tiny helpers can extract up to 87 tons of nitrogen from the air and make it available to the roots of the, their tree friends. That is more than most farmers spread over their fields as fertilizer. So, whereas many trees take pains to budget carefully, elders flaunt their wealth. Ash and elders behave in a similar man manner. Because their splendid thrifts all discard their leaves while they are still green, they don't contribute anything to the fall colors of the forest. Only the misers, it seems, are colorful. No, that's not quite true. Yellow, orange, and red come to the fore when chlorophyll is removed. But these carotenes and anthocyanins are also broken down eventually. The oak is such a careful species that it stashes everything away and discards only brown leaves. Thus, trees differ in their spending habits. Sure. 
it's all over for the beach when it leaves turn brown when its leaves turn brown and yellow whereas the cherry cherry loses its leaves when they're red finally we return to the conifers i've given them rather short shrift so far but there are a are three species that drop their leaves like deciduous trees the larch the bald cypress and the dawn redwood I have no idea why these three conifers are the only ones to follow the deciduous trees example. Perhaps in the evolutionary competition the best way to overwinter has simply not yet been decided. Holding onto, the, onto needles certainly brings advantages in the spring because the trees can get going immediately without having to wait for new growth. However, Many new shoots dry out when the crowns warm up nicely in the spring sun and begin to photosynthesize while the ground is still frozen. Because they can't put the brakes on transpiration, as soon as they become aware of the danger, the needles go limp, particularly those from last year, which don't yet have the thick coat of wax. Apart from that, spruce, pines, firs and douglas firs change out their needles because they too must rid themselves of waste materials. They shed the oldest needles which are damaged and don't work well anymore. As long as the trees are healthy, firs always keep 10, spruce 6 and pines 3 years worth of needles. As you can tell by taking a look at the annual growth intervals on their branches. Pines especially, which shed about a quarter of their green needles, can look somewhat sparse in the winter. In spring, a new year's worth of needles is added along with fresh growth. And the crowns look the picture of health once again. Oh, pretty tree. Sorry, I can't show you. <laughs> okay. Okay, um, that was a bit longer. Cool. Thank you so much for listening. <laughs> if you did. And I hope that you got something from that. And then um, the one that's coming after this is chapter 23. And I like the title of it. It says, A Sense of Time. So I want to leave that with you. Just the phrase, A Sense of Time. Maybe you can think on that. Maybe write something you know, write something down as to, to, you know, what that brings up in you and, and what comes up once you've pondered a little bit on it and um, what perhaps that that correlates to and maybe you can link it to something else that that um, pops up along the way and so as, as, as a piece that wants to just fit right in with that. Anyway, uh, so... Um, yeah, I think that's it. I think that is it for now. I, I feel like there's something that I want to say, but I can't remember what I wanted to say. Hmm. Maybe, maybe it's because I just said what I said, and now I'm thinking a sense of time... Hmm. It's actually really, really deep, Sean. At least when, like, it's like, it goes into, like, different layers of my brain. Like, <laughs> yeah, anyway, that's, that's a picture that, that's also difficult to explain. So, yeah. Oh, gosh. Okay. Um. I think, yeah. It's a parting word, yeah. Um, take care of yourself and be kind to yourself and others. Um, sometimes people <laughs> um, sort of expand their kindness to everybody else and then maybe are, you know, become quite exhausted and then they have no spare kindness to to give themselves or to use to treat themselves as they would treat others so I guess what I'm trying to say is um, 
don't think that you ought to be left out of that um, of that natural exchange or how can I say don't exclude yourself from receiving that kindness especially the kindness that you know you're capable of you you know you you've got to get some of that too and um and, and yeah that's just something that that helps your heart i think it, it, it does and it's a great practice